ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اما بعد first we pray for the brothers and sisters in new zealand may allah azza wa jal make their suffering and make their pain and their loss one that they're able to cope with and one that they're highly rewarded for and may allah azza wa jal write with him that they are amongst the shuhada that they are amongst the martyrs in islam may allah azza wa jal allow the people around us who are not muslim to understand our religion and understand that we don't hate them and understand that we welcome them and i hope bismillah and this Friday khutbah, we can establish just that. Because some time ago, we were sitting down in the work environment and we were in the cafeteria. And I was sitting down and there was, I was the only Muslim in this cafeteria. And a lot of the people that I was sitting with were Jewish and of Christian background. And something interesting happened in the news that morning it was on the media, on all over the headlines, it said something along the lines of a Muslim female doctor out west who said the statement that if I could give the incorrect medicine to all of the Jews to get back at them for what they've done to us Muslims in, in Palestine, I would do just that. A Muslim sister who was a medical doctor said I wish I could give them, if I could, improper medicine. So I could get back at them. So they all turned to me and they said, we, you know, we only wonder because if you look back at her history and her social media, she's constantly saying, may God curse the Jews, and all this stuff on her social media. And so they said, you know, we've known you for some time. Why don't, do you, is this really what you guys think? They're asking, is this how you guys feel about non-Muslims, about the Christians and the Jews? Is this how you guys feel about us? that you want us dead for what's going on around the world? I said, that's interesting. You bring this up. One of the other ones, he said, you know, while, while you're answering that, I have another question. Uh, I always was told about you Muslims that you all envy Hitler and you hate him too. I said, okay, I don't know where you're going with that. He said, but not for the same reason the rest of the world hates him. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you guys hate him because he didn't finish the job. He didn't kill all the rest of them. And now we have to deal with them. That's what you guys believe. Is that, is that true? I said, well, since you guys are asking all these questions, I said, what other questions? I'm curious, because since you guys brought this topic up, what other questions do you have about Islam? Because you already brought these things up, and they're awkward, but we're going to talk about them. And then one person did bring something up, interestingly, and they bring this up from time to time. Is it true that you Muslims, you want to stone the homosexuals and you want to throw them off the Empire State Building, the highest place in the area. I said, wow, quite some loaded questions. And alhamdulillah, when you study this sharia, this, this religion of ours, we know the answers. But then I asked myself, how many Muslims living in the United States know these answers? How, how many of us know how to respond to these answers correctly? So I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring you everything from the Quran and Sunnah, and then you judge whether we're supposed to hate you guys or not. Because this is the misconception about what we hate. And perhaps this is leading to all these terrorists doing these weird uh, terrorist attacks on Muslims. They think that this is the way we believe. But we have to clarify that. That's our requirement upon us Muslims living as a minority in this particular country. So I said, let's start with the Jews. You said this particular Muslim sister who's a medical doctor. Is she misunderstood? Or is in fact this is the hidden teachings of Muslims in our Friday gatherings? I said, if you turn to the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa instructed us to give them da'wah. Ya Ahl al-Kitab. Ahl al-Kitab is what they're referred to in the Qur'an in general, between the Christians and the Jews. They are a type of kufr, a type of disbelief that have particular rulings, specific rulings on how to deal with them. That we're allowed to marry amongst them. That Allah Azza wa allowed the men to marry from the females of Ahl al-Kitab. As long as they are of Christian or Jewish descent or background. And then you come back and you say, when Allah Azza wa reminds us though, 
Mu'minatun khairun min al-mushrika. That Allah Azza said, reminding us though, that a Muslim sister will always be in the eyes of Allah far better than a disbelieving woman. Even, walau a'jabatkum. Even though she looks good to you and she's pleasing to you. Allah is reminding you that your priority is to marry your Muslim sisters. This is not your sisters, obviously, the Muslim girls amongst our religion. But then you come back and I said, and if we're instructed to marry from amongst this, these religions, then you tell me, everyone who's married here, when you wake up, when you decide that this is the girl you're going to spend the rest of your life with, what do you think about? Do you think of a, a different ways that you're going to plot and kill them secretly? Do you think that, or do you think this is a person that I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with? I'm going to have kids with? We're going to establish a good relationship and harmony in the house? And that's how marriage is. And you can't get a stronger relationship than that. And Allah told us we can marry amongst them. That's from the Quran itself. They said, oh, but I heard that in your Quran it curses the Jews. I said, why? Because they called Allah a cheapskate. And that's not just them, that's anyone. That's blasphemy by any religion. Some people, they said, Yad Allah maghlood. They said, Allah withholds. He's, he's cheap, He doesn't give. The Allah is cursing the ones who said it at the time, but if anyone was to repeat that afterwards, they're cursed too. That's not just restricted to one particular person or one particular group. Anyone who speaks ill or has these bad statements about Allah, of course, what do you think is something good about them? That's been in any particular religion. I said, and then if you want to bring back from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, how he implemented in dealing with them, I said, at the time of the, uh, of the uh, treaty, when they uh, signed the treaty in Medina, and the Jewish people living in Medina, they broke the treaty, and they committed treason against the state, espionage. That is punishable by death across the entire world. If you commit treason against the United States, that's punishable by death. And that's in every country. Until these folks who are waving no death penalty started doing this in the, in the most recent time. But if you look back, everyone says this is punishable by death. And when they committed high treason against the Muslims, at that time, the Prophet ﷺ, he gathered them. He gathered them. And he said, bring the judges amongst you. And this is the part we miss in the seerah, in the history of the Prophet ﷺ, his life. He said, bring your judges amongst you. He said, what is the punishment for treason in your book? What's the ruling? They said death. They made this ruling even on, 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 on themselves. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, today I will not execute any one of you, but we cannot trust you any longer. You can't live amongst us, you're exiled. You have to leave the town. You have to leave Medina. And 3,000 of the Jewish people at that very moment accepted Islam immediately. They said, this cannot be a man who's just a just ruler. He has higher priorities. He must be the messenger that we know that was coming. 3,000 of them accepted Islam right at, the, at that moment because of how much mercy the Prophet ﷺ he had with them. 3,000 of them. And then if that's not enough, you look at Khulafa al-Rashidun, the Prophet ﷺ said, they are an example for us. They are an example to be followed. Umar radiallahu anhu, when he went and he got the keys to Bayt al-Maqdis, and the crusaders at the time welcomed him. He signed the treaty that still hangs out there right outside the Holy Sepulchre Church, Kanisatul Qiyama. And next to it is Masjid Umar al Khattab, where he went and he even signed the treaty. And many of the companions also signed that treaty. And in that treaty, it mentions over six times that not a single Kanisa, which is a synagogue or a church, will be harmed. And that a, not a single one will be forced to leave their religion. So we have a theory or a statement that if Muslims were to be ruling over a particular land, it will be the most tolerant land in that area if we're following the Sharia. If we're following the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, If we're following the Quran. And if that's not enough, what did some of our scholars say and how to deal with them? As Shafi'i rahimahullah, he was asked, he said, if I married a Kitabi woman, if I marry a girl from Ahl al-Kitab, from the Christian or the Jewish background, is she allowed to hang the cross in my house? He said, yes. He took her that way. That's her religion. If she wants to hang the cross in the house, she can. He said, what about the book? This book of shirk and Bible and they say these things. He can keep it in the house? He said, yes. And she can read from it at her free will. 
He said, Tabiani, if can I even take her to the Knisa? Can I take her to the church or the synagogue? Can I drive her there? Can I take her? He said, yes. Very, very tolerant religion. You took her that way is not meant to say, oh, that's what I took you, now start changing. That's how you took her, that's how you accept her. And then they said, wow, we really never heard that perspective before. I said, stop. It's not a perspective. Because us, you have to understand these little words that some of them say. Perspective means it's your opinion. I said, that's not my opinion. I quoted you the Quran. I quoted you the life of the Prophet. I quoted you the righteous predecessors. I quoted you our scholars. This is not my opinion. This is our religion. And some people follow it and some people don't. They said, okay, so then what about that girl? I said, this girl, let's come back to her, this mis Muslim doctor. She's misinformed. She's misunderstood. Why? Because she's using emotions and she's not channeling her, her ration properly. Because yeah, what's happening in Palestine is a disaster. What's happening in not just Palestine, many other places. I said, what's going on over there is, um, is an ideology called Zionism. Zionism. Never forget that, brothers and sisters. That is an idea to establish a state that will be a safe haven for who? For Jewish people only, at any cost. At any cost. You can go Google what is Zionism and you can look it up. So I said, what we Muslims are against is Zionism. Not the Jewish religion, because if you look at the Mudaharat and the protests, Okay, even circling the streets of Manhattan sometimes. Why are Jewish people walking along our, along our side? That means we don't have a problem with them. No, we don't. We have a problem with this idea of Zionism. And if you think that it's not a problem, then you go back to some of their statements that they've said. In the year 2014, 2014 an academic scholar from Ben Ilan University in Israel, do you know what he said? He was on national radio. This is a scholar in academia who's training and teaching the next generation. He says a statement and he said, if you want the Palestinian people to stop uh, committing crimes against the state, he said, rape their women. He said, rape their sister, rape their daughter, rape their mother. They won't do anything because they have a very soft spot for their ladies. He said, then they'll stop. And the guy, the radio host, who's Jewish, he says, well, obviously we can't resort to that. He said, no, no, you have to. He said, the Middle East, this is the Middle East, it's a sad place. He was serious. The radio host was shocked for crying out loud. But he said he was serious. This is an academic scholar. And then if that wasn't enough in mid-2016, the man who was going to be the chief rabbi of the IDF, he says, if you find the soldiers' morale low, if you find that they're sad, they're not up, you know, they're not with good morale. He said, if they need to boost their morale, because they're in the army, it is okay for them to rape Palestinian women. It's fine to boost the morale of the army. This is the sickness that they promote. I told you at any cost. And then I said, now you see where our problem is? This is where our problem is. I said, but you look at our religion, we can't even go to that level. I said, in the worst time, in a time of war, us Muslims were instructed that we can't even harm an elderly person. We can't harm a child. We can't harm a woman unless she's bearing arms against us. We can't even pluck a tree unless it's for a reason. But if there's any Muslim, you tell me, give me one scholar in the history of the last 1,400 years, in any book you can find that said, yeah, you know what, go rape them, it's fine, you need it. Give me one. Not a single one. And even if someone did say such a statement, the entire Muslim world would condemn it. Everybody say, this guy is off the beating path. He's off the, he's off the reservation. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We're not allowed to do that. We would condemn it. I said, but what hurts me is that I don't see you folks, the people that I work with, Jewish people, I don't see you condemning these statements. I don't see you on Facebook and everywhere saying, no, that is absolutely wrong. This is crazy. This is madness. I said, so this is where our problem lies. They said, okay, well, then what about Hitler? I said, okay, let's talk about Hitler. Allah referenced him in the Quran. They said, what? I said, yeah, he's mentioned in the Quran. I said, where? where, where? I said, you see, Allah Azzawajal mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 32, and part of it, he said, مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسًا أَوْ فَسَادًا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا The Allah Azzawajal said very clearly in the Quran. They said, what it says? 
I said it says that anyone who kills and murders an innocent soul without a right cause, without a, a reason, then it's as if he killed all of mankind. All of mankind. I said, he's spoken about. And the Allah in, this, in the Quran, he didn't mention any Muslim, innocent Muslim. He said nafsin. That means anyone, human. Do you understand that? So us as Muslims, we have to condemn to the highest level this psycho Hitler that existed in history. At every level. And we're not supposed to joke about that. And I know some people do that. And unfortunately, I hear some people saying these kind of things. That's wrong. You're given the wrong conception, you're the misunderstanding about what we believe in. That if you think it's okay to joke about these things. And then Allah Azza wa Jal even said, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا That and whoever saves an innocent soul, it's as if he saved all of mankind. That's the religion we believe in. I said, so we, can, we, we condemn what happened at that Holocaust 100% from then and until the day of judgment if anybody else decides to think about that. They said, we never heard of that before. I said, I'm quoting you the Quran. This Quran isn't changed. You could go to any masjid you want and open it up and you can check it. It's the verses that I quoted you. They said, okay, well, what about these, uh, the gay people? I said, okay, I want to make a very clear statement. And this is what we have to understand. This is how we have the dialogue with non-Muslims, brothers and sisters. So they understand our religion. I said, you have to understand one thing imp very important. Homosexuality will never be accepted in our religion, period. That's just never going to happen. It's not going to, there's no fatwa for it, there's nothing. There's no, uh, if there's a, a dire need, no. It's just never going to happen. And I said, in regarding the capital punishment of such a person or persons that are caught doing such a thing in public, it is up to the state to enact such a punishment. And that's it if they were doing it in public. Because Islam, I want to make something clear, protects everyone and anything they do if they do it inside their house. If they do something in the privacy of their house, even if it might be, may Allah protect us, zina or even drink alcohol, that's not up to the Muslim state to get involved in. That's private. You're not allowed to. That's our sharia. We don't go around with police looking in doors and opening windows. What's this fella doing over here? No, we don't do that. I said, but if somebody was to take the step to be outward and flaunting and showing it in public and I'm proud, well, that's for the state to deal with that. But guess what? Allah said in the Quran that we live by the law of the land that we live in. We, we abide by it as long as it doesn't contradict what we, what we do day to day in our Islam. I said, and we live in the United States and you don't have that law and we're not trying to champion that law. I said, what we're saying here is that we live amongst you and this is something that is, we're going to follow those particular laws. That's just how it is. I said, but how we deal with them in the United States is very clear. And you look at the Quran again, where Allah Azza told us how to deal with them. Allah mentioned very clearly in Surah, uh, in, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, in verse, part of verse 78, on, with the Prophet Lut alayhi salam, and how he dealt with them. How he dealt with the people that were homosexual at the time. And this one verse will teach us a whole lot, but it might make us a little uncomfortable because we have a, we have a job to do in this country. Allah said, That Allah said, What did Lut say to his people? First, first word in this verse, He had a dialogue with them. He talked with them. He discussed with them. And then he said, Ya qawmi. You guys are part of my community. You guys are part of my community. What I find in the United States and in our area, we isolate ourselves from them. We don't even talk to them. We see two of them doing, walking with each other. Oh, you turn the other way and you run the other direction. But here, Allah is just telling us we have to give da'wah to them. We have to talk to them. And you might not think that, oh, it's not possible, they won't change. That's not true. There's many doctors and there's many people out there, even in the United States, that are sitting there and they work with those with the, that kind of people that have that kind of fitna. And you have to understand something that is a fitna. That is a test for some people who have that inclination, who have the inclination to the same gender. What we are held accountable in Islam, and this is what I told them, and never forget this, is the actions that you take. The Prophet he said, you don't have control over your heart. Allah does. And he even mentioned that with Khadija. He said, what can I tell you? Allah in, 
instilled and he filled my heart with love for her. He said, and Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who has control of our hearts. But it's the action that you take. And then somebody might say, oh, but that's sad. He's never going to get the love of his life. Well, he's not the only one. There's some guys who they pass by some other man's wife and they become in love with her. That's haram. You can't. That's just how it goes. There might be a poor person who, do you think he could justify robbing a bank? Well, I'm poor. I didn't get money. I need money. I'll take it. There, everyone is given a fitna. It's the action that you take that you're held accountable for. So it's not like we're deciding whether they have this or they don't have this inclination. It's the actions that you take. And when you sit down and you decide to take on this challenge, you might find the results are staggering. So last year, there was a brother who approached me and he had this problem. He had this homosexual problem. And I said, you know, I'm going to sit with him and see if we can have a discussion. Sat with him and talked with him. Alhamdulillah, months later, he completely left it. And he said, you know, I have to say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, I moved away from all of those things that brought those thoughts to my mind. And I kept on making dua to Allah and now I just completely stay away from any of those things that trigger those thoughts. And you, you have that ability, but we have two jobs to do. One, you have to recognize that they're part of our community. It's not like, oh, they'll let them just do their thing as long as they don't affect me. They will affect you. Tomorrow, they'll adopt kids and those kids, they'll be your, your children's friends in school. And they're going to talk about that. And they're going to ask two dads versus two moms. And you have to address that. This is our community. We have to be proactive in this community. That's how we are. This is, how, this is the Muslim way. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He allows us as Muslims living in this area to be the da'wah for them to let them understand this religion of ours. To let them know that we do not hate Jewish people. That we do not champion Hitler. That we don't sit there and we're looking to kill and investigate all the homosexual relationships in the United States or the world. That is not our religion. I hope that we can have this dialogue and show them that inst actually it's quite the opposite. This is the religion that we have that's instilled with love and welcoming for them. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد So then what is it that we want as Muslims then? You know here's something very interesting موسى عليه السلام uh, He asked Allah He said oh Allah He said teach me something that I can worship you with that no one else worships you with. Allah Azza wa Jal responded to Musa. He said, say, La ilaha illallah. Say that there is only one Lord worthy of worship, and that is Allah. No deities, no brothers, no sisters, cousins. That's it. You know Musa said? He said, oh Allah, everything created in the samawat wal ard says that. They worship you with that, oh Allah. I want something for me to worship you and get closer to you. He said, Ya Musa. He said, oh Musa. He said the mizan on the day of judgment and the Prophet ﷺ explained us this, this scale on the day of judgment that Jibreel will be holding the mizan on the day of judgment. And the Prophet ﷺ told us about this mizan, how big it is in this response that Allah just said to Musa. He said, if you were to fill all of the creation that I created between the samawat wal ard, O Musa, and you put it on one side of the scale, and you put La ilaha illallah on the other side, it would outweigh them. It would outweigh them. This one statement, this one belief of one Allah, one Lord. No partners, no sons, no cousins, no brothers, sisters, daughters, any of that. That's it. This, just this one statement. And you might not even grasp what all of the creation is, but on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when we're all gathered, the jinn kind and the, and the human kind, and Allah Azza the Prophet Sallallahu told us that when we're gathered and all of the angels that are gathered there and the skies start crashing down, the heavens start breaking apart. He said just in the first heaven, the amount of angels that exist in the first heaven, they will outnumber all of the angels and all of the humans and all of the creation, the animals, the bugs, everything you can imagine, they will outnumber them. Just the angels there. And as they keep on breaking all the way up to the sixth, each, each level will outnumber everything before it and including the level before it. This creation is a lot that you can't even comprehend. 
you can't comprehend. And imagine all of that on one side of the scale and just the kalima la ilaha illallah. In the Prophet ﷺ even told us that there will be a man who comes on the day of judgment but he fell short of his deeds. He did a lot of bad deeds, didn't live such a great life. And he will be given the judgment to enter hellfire. May Allah Azza protect us. And as he's going, Allah Azza sends a messenger. He sends an angel and calls out. He says, wait, you have one deed that hasn't been weighed yet. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, this man will have bad deeds, say yet, as far as his eyes can see from every direction. 99 registers full of deeds as far as the eyes can see. And the man will turn around and he'll say, he said, what is this one deed you're going to weigh? That's going to outnumber this. He thought that's it, he's doomed. He said, the deed that you have left is la ilaha illallah. And they put it on the scale and it will outweigh all of those bad deeds. And then you recognize this is what we want as Muslims. Our goal is to show them the beauty of this religion and just get them to accept this religion. To recognize that this is the same religion of Adam, the same religion of Nuh, Noah, the same religion of Moses, the same religion of Jesus. All of them, they had the same religion. So I was sitting at dinner with them. We were sitting at dinner later. And we were just having dinner and they said, you know, I respect what you do. I said, what is that? They said, you know how you go every two hours or whatever, you go and pray and you come back. I respect that, you know, and there's, there's these things that you do, you know, I just couldn't be Muslim, uh, your religion, because of that. I said, why? He said, because, you know, look at what you have to do. Every two hours you go there. I said, that's it, just because of that? He said, no. He said, and then you guys do that month-long thing where you don't eat. He said, oh, I, got, I got to eat. I said, wow. I said, what other reason you, you're thinking that you don't want to be uh, Muslim? He said, well, there's this other thing where you guys, uh, you can't drink. That's a big problem for me. I need my beer. I said, oh. I said, wow. I said, well, you know, even if you did all of those things and you didn't fulfill those obligations, there's one statement. If you said that statement and you believed in it, actually that statement could eventually lead you to paradise. Ah, anyway, so I kept eating. And they said, well, wait a minute. Well, what's the statement? I said, what do you care? You don't want to be Muslim anyway. They said, well, if it's one statement and you said that that's going to eventually bring me to paradise, it's just the statement. I said, so you want to know? They said, yeah, we, just for curiosity. I said, okay. That you believe that there's only one Lord worthy of worship and that there's no other Lord or deity worthy of worship except God, except the Lord Allah. And that all those prophets and those famous men that you heard throughout history, Job, Lot, Ayyub, Hizqil, uh, 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 all of them, the Adam, Noah, Jesus, Ib Ibrahim, Jacob, Ismail, Muhammad, Jesus, Zechariah, all of those men are prophets of God that were sent to tell us how to worship God. That's it. That's it? I said, that's it. This religion didn't change. It was the same religion from the beginning of time to the end of time. It's whoever followed that messenger and accepted Islam. Very simple. They said, huh? I said, yeah. I said, and you don't even have to say that in front of me. You could walk back to the hotel and you could say that on the way to the hotel and you just firmly believe it between you and God. And that could be the thing that saves you from hellfire and puts you into paradise eventually. He said, well, what about my beer? I said, Allah said in the Quran, he could, have, he could forgive that. Oh, really? I said, really? He said, what if I go to Atlantic City? I said, Allah said in the Quran, he can forgive that. But there's one thing Allah mentioned very clear, that if you die upon shirk, knowingly you're dying upon shirk and worshiping multiple gods and things like that, that's something Allah will not forgive. He said, that's it. He said, that's it. And I hope that we as Muslims explain this to these people that are around us. This is our community. Please take it like that. It's not just here. This is our jama'ah. This is our brothers and sisters. This is our family. But this is our community. And we have to care about them. We live amongst them. They're going to shape the next generation. And I ask Allah Jalla that He allows them all to see this beautiful religion of Islam. And He recognizes that we don't have this hate inside of us. And He recognizes that, and they recognize that they should stop if they had any bad inclinations toward us. May Allah Jalla allow us to be that beacon of da'wah to them, to allow them to see this beautiful religion of Tawheed. Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt, wa'afina fi man afayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt.